Welcome. Hello. It's nice to see everybody. Thanks for coming uh, to the talk for One Campus, One Book on the Year of Democratic Engagement. It's pouring rain outside, so it's nice and warm in here under the lights. So welcome. It's nice to see everybody. Uh, today we will be talking about um, one of our favorite characters from the hit musical of Hamilton. And thank you, Diane, for asking me to come and to include, you know, include me in this uh, talk to speak about what I was described in our advertisement as Hamilton's better half, right? So when I was reading that, I was trying to think, well, would I consider him, would I consider her his better half? And I, I think, I think morally that would be an easy one. So yes, perhaps she was certainly his better half morally, but they were both pretty powerful, interesting people, both amazing individuals. And the truth is that women's history, as you know, I, that's what I do, you know, I teach women in American history. And so it's a, you know, honor and a privilege for me to be able to tell the stories of the people who we never get to hear about for most of our, you know, for much of U.S. history, we've never heard her story. We've always heard his story. So um, I have been a Hamilton fan since long before the play was ever, you know, out. I can tell you that when I was um, 19 years old, I remember going to a bookstore to go buy the Federalist Papers, and it wasn't even an assignment. It was just because I wanted to read them, because I had this obsessive, you know, drive to know everything about Alexander Hamilton. So then, of course, when I learned that there was this new, you know, musical coming out with Hamilton, it was exciting, and we couldn't wait to see it. And uh, of course, my dear friend and colleague Beth and I got to see it because we, you know, taught this class together with uh, U.S. history and English. So. Once um, I saw the play, I absolutely was, it was amazing. And I don't know how many of you have seen it, but I hope if you have not, you will make time or get there somehow um, whenever it comes back or fly wherever you have to go to see it. And um, I will also say that the play has been not only something I've enjoyed, you know, that I thought the music was wonderful, but it also has brought um, me an opportunity that I don't usually get. I have a 10 year old daughter um, who is very much her father's daughter and likes everything her father likes and almost nothing that I do or like or ever did as a girl is, is she has no interest whatsoever. I did ballet, she never wants to do dance. You know, I, whatever I like, she's always the opposite. But when I played the musical Hamilton for her, um, things started to change, okay? And this is something my daughter and I have bonded over, okay? So those um, items here are not things that I gave to her. Those are things she requested. Okay. So there's my daughter wearing her Eliza. I don't know if you can see with the lights the way they are, but she has her t-shirt with um, you know, Eliza, Angelica, and Peggy on it. And she's currently reading the um, young adult version of uh, the Hamilton biography based off the turnout book, but you know, for children. And it's not the one that we'll be talking about later with Professor Scrifano. Um, so uh, she's an absolute fan, absolutely uh, has, knows every lyric, which Maybe I shouldn't admit because maybe some of them are 100% appropriate for a child. But she loves the play and she's been begging to go. And I can say that it's a historian's and a mother's dream to have something that your child wants to know everything about it and they want to know who was Hamilton and who was Eliza and what was the Constitutional Convention. I can't tell you how many hours I've spent talking to my daughter and my daughter's friends in the car listening to the music and then they'll ask me questions about how the cabinet worked in the United States government. It's amazing and for that reason alone it's a brilliant show and that's just one of you know a million different things that I could say about it. So um, Eliza herself, next please. Sorry, I'm having a hard time with getting this to go. So the women in the revolution is the picture that I have here. And I think that if I was, you know, asking everyone in this audience to tell me three famous people from the American Revolution, you'd have no problem saying, you know, Hamilton, Jefferson, Franklin. But if I asked you to tell me about three important women from the American Revolution, I think that, I don't know, do you guys think you could do it? You probably might have, a, it might be a little bit longer. So I think we've, all we've ever been told is that it was Betsy Ross who sold a flag, and that's about it, which is actually very far from the truth. And I think it's so amazing that for a home front war that was fought for eight years in the United States, well, future United States, that involved so much suffering and so many different, you know, aspects of American life, that women are somehow written out of this story for most of our history. It was as if the revolution happened and they weren't even there. You know, and that's clearly not the case. Women were crucial for the actual success of the revolution. And I think that Elizabeth Hamilton is certainly someone, Elizabeth Schuyler Hamilton, is certainly somebody who was inspired by the revolution as so many were. Um, there is a, that is one of the um, portraits we have from her from the Library of Congress. There's very few images of her. We only have, you know, a select amount of her. And you might already know that we don't have very many of her letters. 
Uh, we do have some, but we don't have many. And as a historian of American women, you're, you're always trying to find the sources, and often you'll find it's difficult to get to those sources. And in the case of Eliza Hamilton, there are very few sources about her feelings for Alexander, at least. Her correspondence with her husband, Alexander Hamilton, or we do not have any of them. And that's, you know, kind of a, been something that the play would address. Okay, um, next, please. So that's her father, Philip Schuyler. Um, he was a general in the American Revolution. He had been a member of the um, continent. He was a member of the state, you know, Congress in New York. He would be a member of the Continental Congress. He'd be at the Constitutional Convention. And he was very interested in his large family. He and his wife had, I don't know, they had, sev they had 17 children total. Not all of them survived to adulthood. And he raised his daughter, Eliza, and her sisters. Her, she was Elizabeth. It's easier, I think, to say Eliza, so for this talk, I'll just stick with Eliza. So um, Elizabeth, or Eliza, she was raised by her dad to be encouraged to have an uh, interest in the world around her and to understand politics. And one thing that I recently um, was reading about was how her father, Philip, took her to meet with the Iroquois Confederacy in um, the years just before the American Revolution. So he went as a delegate to speak with them as we were getting ready to go to war against Great Britain. And we were, it was crucial for the U.S. to have the Iroquois, you know, the Americans wanted the Iroquois on their side. So he brought his 13-year-old daughter, Eliza, to go meet with some of the chiefs of the Iroquois Confederacy. And I think that's a pretty amazing experience for anyone to have, especially a young 13-year-old girl. So she's exposed to all kinds of interesting things around her. She's not just a taught to, you know, just sew and cook or what we would traditionally think of with women of this day. Um, she had, you know, a large family. There's a couple of the s names that you probably know in these images, but it's kind of hard to see, you know, we have the Peggy, Angelica, and Eliza are the big three in there in that, you know, that are in the play. That is the um, Schuyler Mansion where she would be married to the young, dashing um, Colonel Alexander Hamilton um, in the uh, later years of her life. So that is um, the winter they met was 1779. She had met him once before actually at a dinner party. They had, I guess, just talked briefly. But then he was stationed um, as a Revolutionary War soldier uh, near the home of her aunt where she was staying. And so the two of them will be better acquainted and that is where they fell in love. And apparently they fell in love very quickly and very desperately. But we only know that from his letters. We don't have hers. But I, I think that it's pretty clear from the rest of her record that there was a lot of love there for her husband. Um, his letters are pretty funny. When you, if you haven't had a chance, I hope you will read through some of them. Um, this, I'm sorry, I was trying to see which I was starting with here. That's when he first met her, of course, and he, he seems to call her this quite a bit. He calls her a, a, an enchantress, and, and he, she, he says, you've mystified me with your powers and your, your enchanting you know, um, power over me and such. So he has a great facility of language. You probably know he's you know, one of our um, brilliant writers in American history, but his letters, while being quite brilliant, they often are quite silly, and they often reveal a lot about him if you look at them for a while. So he's, you know, telling her how much he loves her, you know, um, how he thinks of her night and day, and he can't, he can't go to sleep at night without thinking of her, and he can't wake up in the morning without thinking of her, and he just thinks about her all the time, and, you know, from the moment he met her, that's all he cares about. But the one that, um, I'm sorry, could you go back one? I'm sorry, the next one, sorry, this is a letter, I that's the one I like. <laughs> but it says, but why do you not write me more oftener? Okay, because he's writing to her all the time. Why do you not write me more oftener? It is again an age since I have heard from you. He's writing to her all the time. I write you at least three letters for your one. Though I'm, interest, I'm immersed in public business and you have nothing to do but to think of me. <laughs> so he's convinced that you know, she's just sitting around waiting for him and so frustrated that you know, she hasn't written back as quickly. And I've, I've wondered why did she do that? Did she purposely wait to write back? You know, was that sort of part of her, you know, you know they were date, courting you know, and she doesn't want to be too eager. I don't know. And, and we don't know because we don't have her letters back to him. So um, his letters, you know, I have several examples that you guys can see that he, he you know, professes his love for her, and I think that there was a true love for each other. Although, you know, many have speculated that Alexander Hamilton, coming from a very, you know, modest, to say the least, background, his parents were not married, he was an immigrant from, you know, the Caribbean, who um, was often, you know, dismissed for not being of, of the elite status and, you know, coming from a, you know, a mother who was, you know, not married, an unmarried woman, often called a prostitute. So um, for him, he had no money and to marry Elizabeth Schuyler would be certainly something that would help his status. So of course there's speculation, did he really care or did he just want to become, you know, a member of entrance into, um, you know, New York society? I think he did love her. 
I mean, we'll never know for sure how much. I'm sure there's a little bit of everything in that. You know, there's probably a little bit of the, you know, well, her family's very rich and her father is a really influential politician. And um, that'll, you know, come to be very important to him through his life. I have that. Okay. I'm sorry, I did not know that I wouldn't be able to see my slides, so I can, I can just go off the cuff or I'm going to just try to sort of see them while I'm talking. So um, they did have eight children total. So I think right there, I could probably stop my talk right there, and I think I've said enough to say how great this woman was and how amazing she was and what she contributed. Now think about this, she had eight children, and, and when some of the most tragic moments of her life happened, it was when she was pregnant with one of these children. Um, her son died when she was pregnant. Her son died and was killed in a duel. Her 19-year-old, you know, light and, sh you know, the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth to her died when she was pregnant. Um, when she discovered, you know, terrible truth about her husband that was revealed to the public, she was pregnant. And as a woman who's been pregnant, I can think only of how difficult it must have been to be faced with such, you know, challenging things while being pregnant. So she is a wonderful mother and she, sur you know, makes it through and she's, she's tough as nails. I mean, this woman survives long past her husband. While her husband, Alexander, um, goes on from the revolution, distinguishing himself as an aide to George Washington. You know, he asks him to be his aide or his secretary. And, of course, you know, Hamilton wants to fight, but he ends up being, you know, a brilliant help to Washington. And that'll lead him to his future, marrying um, the daughter of Philip Schuyler, helps him to become one of the members of the Continental Congress. And, uh, I'm sorry, the Constitutional Convention. And then he will become one of the, cab the first cabinet member of the Secretary of the Treasury under George Washington. So Eliza spends her life, her married life with um, Alexander around some of the most amazing individuals in history. And she's quite close with Martha Washington. And she and Martha Washington apparently had some sort of a relationship that was somewhat of a mother-daughter relationship. And they were quite close and Washington was quite close and, and thought very highly of her and of Alexander. So there are Secretary of the Treasury, and there's um, the, you know, um, the big inaugural sort of a ball with Martha Washington's entrance, and the Hamiltons were, an inten were a, in attendance of it. Um, I want to mention, too, that while Hamilton was busy as, you know, the aide to Washington and as a member of the, you know, first cabinet of the President of the United States, that he was constantly um, speaking to Eliza about his work. He was reading his speeches and letters to her. Um, she gave him all kinds of feedback, and one of the, the you know, documents that he wrote that was so important to her that everybody knew he wrote it was Washington's farewell address. And that um, document is, that, that farewell address is actually read in the play, if you get to see Hamilton, and it's a brilliant way that they, in, you know, interweave it with the music. But she would have been someone who gave him, you know, I wonder how many drafts of this did they go through together that she gave him, you know, ideas about. And that's, of course, um, Philippa Sue and Lin-Manuel Miranda playing Eliza and Alexander Hamilton. And the three sisters that were on my little girl's shirt when we started. And there's been a much in the play. I don't know. How many of you actually have seen it? I've, I want to ask. How many of you have actually seen the play? Okay. So the rest of you will go see the play. But those who have seen it, okay. There's this whole, you know, idea that perhaps Alexander was having an affair or in love with her sister Angelica. And that there's a great song where Angelica regrets that she didn't go for Alexander first and so on and so forth. But that's all the, that's like the biggest fiction I could find in this play. Um, because she was already married when Alexander met her, and he could not have married her. And I don't know that, that I think that was a pretty um, good sort of uh, fictional creation, recreation that he made. Could you go back one time? Back, please. Thanks. So that's Angelica Schuyler, who was a happily married woman, I guess, happily. However, um, we do have the letters between her and Alexander, and they did have a great deal of affection and fondness for each other, but he, he was very flirtatious with every woman that he wrote to. And that was his character, and she seemed to be okay with it. So I don't think there was any physical affair. I don't know that we'll ever know that. Um, but, and they will remain close. Angelica and Eliza will be close um, until their death. The question that I think Diane's gonna address is, you know, how do we see women? How does the play Hamilton show women? And are they really in the story? Or did Hamilton just go back to the same old stereotypes? It's all about the men. And, you know, I've read lots of critiques of the play that women have so little time on stage and that, you know, it's just another one of these, you know, male dominated stories. And I, I really disagree with that. I think that um, he very specifically includes women throughout the play. This is a picture of Thomas Jefferson. You know, this is a scene with Thomas Jefferson having one of his big cabinet, you know, debates with Alexander Hamilton. But as you can see, there's a woman sitting there. 
And we all know there wouldn't have been a woman in the cabinet, you know, meetings or in the congressional meetings, but he's got women on stage the whole play. And they are, obviously they would not literally have been there, but I think the fact that he's included them and he's, you know, made this a show that helps us understand the United States today from our perspective today is brilliant. And he starts the play, you know, and ends the, the play, the you know, the story ends with her. The play itself ends with, and with Eliza. So I think that he's made quite an effort. One of the really dramatic moments that I think, um, you, you know, that um, Professor Scofano is going to talk about is, of course, the fact that the downfall of Alexander for his political career was that he had uh, an affair. He did have an illicit affair with a woman, um, Maria Reynolds, who I don't think any photograph or any images of her survived. I've looked and looked and looked. And there's a lot online, but they're not really her. So I, I don't know exactly how, if we have any real images of her, but she, it's, it's a long story. He has this illicit affair. However, it would have hopefully just gone away and he, no one would have known except for um, his political rivals caught wind of it um, years later. So it's a long, you know, probably one of the worst moments in her life, I would imagine. But Alexander Hamilton decided to uh, write his own version of what had happened between him and the woman he'd had the affair with because his political rivals, particularly James Monroe, who was not in the play, but it was James Monroe who was really out to get him and wanted to release this information. Apparently, um, Hamilton wanted to make sure everyone knew that he had, of course, you know, been and conducted himself in ways that were inappropriate and immoral, but that he had not uh, violated his role as, you know, the Secretary of the Treasury because the allegations were that he had been stealing money, embezzling money from the United States Treasury. And he didn't want that story to be told. To him, his, you know, the word that comes up in the, you know, that Lin-Manuel Miranda is constantly going back to is his legacy, his legacy. And so that's what matters to him is his legacy. So he writes um, his pamphlet later called the Reynolds pamphlet. And it's about his affair. Eliza is pregnant when this pamphlet is released to the public. So, I mean, if you can imagine, she's eight months pregnant. So, you know, any woman today having a public you know, her, her husband's public affair and everyone's talking about you and calling you all kinds of names. Now it's colonial America. You can only imagine how much worse it would have been. And she was pregnant. Um, we don't know what her exact feelings were, but later in life, she constantly defends him, saying that they were just out to get him. Um, this image was important to me, and I, I hope you can see it a bit. This was a wine cooler that George Washington sent to her right after the affair became public knowledge and the pamphlet was released. George Washington sent Elizabeth a wine cooler, a very precious one, with a very loving note on it um, as a way of, you know, indicating his support for her, which I, I think is such an amazing sort of gesture. I mean, he's, you know, he's George Washington doing this. You know, it's, it's amazing. So the whole, you know, Washington, D.C. and New York, everyone's talking about what a scandalous, you know, terrible person he is and how awful the whole scenario is. And he just sends her this very loving note with a beautiful wine cooler, which she kept until she died. And I recently read that it was sold in 2012 for $762,000 by Christie's Auction House. So um, that was before the play. So I imagine what they would have gotten if it was later. I, w I don't know how it became a public item for sale, but um, it, it would stay with her her whole life. And apparently when she was 90 years old, she would entertain people. She would constantly, you know, sort of, you know, at some point show them the wine cooler that George Washington had given her, her, her Hamilton, she called him her Hamilton. And that, of course, was the other tragedy that I'd mentioned a moment ago, that her son Philip, the bright shining future, was um, in a duel and was shot and would die shortly thereafter. And I think for me, as a woman, thinking about what were the worst challenges she had, the scandal and the affair, of course, but not only does her son die when he's 19 and just about to start his life, and he's so handsome and everybody loves him and he's so brilliant, he's like, you know, the future rests on him. And, um, you know, she finds out that Alexander was the one who had given him the pistol to bring to the duel. So for me, that would be the one that would, I'd have a hard time forgiving. And she's a very forgiving woman, apparently. So. Um, he was not, apparently, we know that he told Philip, though, not to shoot his opponent to kill him. You know, the duel was for your reputation more than it was for really to try to kill somebody. And we know that his, Philip's friend's letters reflect this. His, his friend's letters have said, you know, his friend said that General Hamilton told him not to, you know, to throw away his shot, so to speak, or not to fire at the opponent, George Eaker, but he was killed anyway. Um, after this, everything changes for their family dynamic. Uh, Hamilton becomes so depressed, they said that he had to be held up at the funeral. Eliza, I think in a way, demonstrates more outward strength 
and she is able to hold herself together in the public eye more so than her husband in the you know weeks just after the event of or the death of her beloved Philip but of course they carry on and the child that she gives birth to at that point she will name Philip in his you know after her poor son who had been killed um, Hamilton will pour himself into their new home the Grange which um, he will, they will only be there for about two and a half years before Hamilton himself will then go in his own duel against his political opponent using the same gun that his son used when he was shot. And I, I find that amazing to think that his son and all the suffering, and all the pain and all the horrible things they've gone through, and then he goes and does it himself. You know, he's just seen how much his wife had suffered. And that's, of course, his goodbye letter to her. And um, you know, he writes these letters to leave for her in case he's killed at the duel, right? You always do that just in case. And the thing that gets me when I read this one is, you know, he's telling her that he hopes to see her in a better world. Apparently he became much more religious in the years after his son, you know, died, those couple years. But he's hoping to see her in the other world. But then he ends it by saying, um, you know, of course, you're the best of wives and best of women, but embrace all of my darling children for me. And I thought, well, isn't that crazy? Here he's thinking of his kids and how she should embrace them. What good is embracing them? He should have been there to raise them. You know, it seems like such a ridiculous, uh, romantic idea. You know, I'm going to go duel and, you know, embrace our kids. But he should have been there for his kids. Um, it just strikes me. It's so odd that he would go do it. She will never say a word against him, at least that we have any records of. All the documents tell us how much she loves him. Weeks after his death, she's calling him her angel, her, her love. She calls him my Hamilton for the rest of her life. But he also leaves her with no money. And her home has to be sold in auction, the Grange that they had just built. But this guy, Governor Morris, this individual, one of our leaders of the American Revolution, who had um, taken a great you know, interest in Hamilton and a, a relatively decent working relationship and such, he puts together a secret fund with 100 other of their friends and other Federalists to buy the house back and to then sell it back to Eliza for half price so that she doesn't have to lose her house. And they donate something like a large amount of money for years and years and years to help her raise all of her children, which I th think was, you know, truly speaks volumes of what they thought of her as well as perhaps him. And it's 50 years is how long she's going to live after he dies. So she's not going to, she's going to not just uh, be obscure in the record at that point. Next, please. Next slide, please. Um, she will go on to do amazing things. And this is, you know, really the, so much of her legacy. Her legacy is that she became one of the founding members of the New York uh, Children's um, Orphanage Asi or Asylum, Asylum, as they called it at that day, the first public orphanage in New York City, which is still in operation today, which she worked at, at you know, for decades and decades. She would be the directoress of this orphanage, involved in all the administrative duties and, um, you know, directly involved with the kids. And... It's obviously received quite a bit of attention since the play, this orphanage. She will also be absolutely clear that she must leave the authentic and legitimate record of her husband's life and what he had done as you know, this leading founding father. And she felt like he was not going to get that story told. So she spent years and years working with his papers. Hamilton wrote more than anyone, apparently. And so she hired, at one point, she had 30 people working for her to try to go through his papers, to document his history, and to write his story. And it never happens. It takes years and years. Eventually, her son, uh, John Church Hamilton, will write it. But um, it will not, it'll be a seven-volume work on his father, Alexander Hamilton. But it won't be published until after she's passed. But it is, that is crucial to her, that his story is with us today. And we can see she succeeded in that. And if it wasn't for her, that story wouldn't be here. And I think that gives her a lot of, uh, her own narrative of her own life comes through clearly, even if we don't have it the way that we might want to have it. Um, next slide, please. I don't know if you all know this as well, but I think Washington, obviously, being someone who was so important to her and so dear to her, that she would be um, one of the people who was responsible for raising the funds for the Washington Monument. Dolly Madison was another, but she would be there for the opening event of the you know, groundbreaking for the building of the Washington Monument. And that is another one of her really important legacies that I think is a, you know, clearly speaks volumes for the kind of person she was in her later years. She continued to work at the orphanage. She continued to give back to society. She continued to be part of Washington and New York society, um, you know, social events. And president after president would come visit her um, during her life. And it was, you know, somewhat of a status and an honor to go see the, you know, Eliza Hamilton before, you know, she was gone. That's from President Polk in 1842 telling us how 
uh, completely you know, vivacious and amazing she was still in such an advanced age. She will go on to live to be 97. And right shortly before her death, one visitor who had seen her in DC um, at her daughter's home where she was staying said that she usually would speak with everyone after dinner and, and she would be um, part of the evening discussions and fun, but that she kind of snuck off to the other room and was sort of in the back by herself and wasn't her, wasn't her happy self or her frivolous self, he said. And when he asked her, you know, how, how was she or what was wrong, you know, she told him she was just so tired and she was just longing to see her Hamilton. And shortly thereafter, she would be reunited with him and she will be buried next to him um, at the Trinity Church. Uh, that's a poem that he wrote to her or a sonnet, I don't know. I guess you could probably answer that better than I could, but I think I've, I've seen it referred to as both ways. But this was something she wore around her neck her whole life from the day he died until her death. It was a poem that he wrote to her when they were first, you know, courting. She wore that around her neck um, in a little bag that she'd kind of sewn together. She wrote that and apparently his goodbye letter that I had showed you as well. I think all of this, it's clear how she feels about him. We don't need to have her letters to know that she loved him and that she forgives him. I mean, all of this information is what we, you know, walk away with. I do want to also quickly tell you guys that that orphanage is still around. It is now called the Graham Wyndham Agency, and that they have started in the last year or two uh, the, something called the Eliza Project, where the actual actors of the Hamilton cast, like David Diggs and Philippa Sue, who plays um, Eliza, are um, working with a lot of the students and young children in the um, agency um, who want to, in a variety of different, you know, um, performing arts and dramatic arts and so they are and they've also raised you know, tens of thousands of dollars since the play um, so this legacy of hers something that was so important to her an orphanage of course her husband having been an orphan and someone who comes from this you know sad background something that she will dedicate so much of her time to I think it's amazing that it's still here I think it's amazing that it's just going to get more and more um, you know sort of fame and, and interest and I think that's probably something she would want to end with. So that's where I have left this. And I will turn this back over to you. Okay, for sure. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much. Thank, you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. OK, I don't know how much justice I can do after uh, Susan's wonderful historical presentation, but um, I'm Diane Scrofano, and um, I teach English. And um, I am currently teaching a class that is uh, themed for young adult literature. So I thought it would be interesting, having um, one semester before taught the play Hamilton, to uh, take these new students, my new guinea pigs, <laughs> and um, teach them uh, Hamilton as well as a young adult adaptation. Uh, called Alex and Eliza. So our presentation here today is looking at uh, the real Eliza and the fictional uh, Eliza. Um, so and let's see, uh, we'll go to the next slide here. Okay, all right. So some of the critics uh, have been uh, uh, critical of the play Hamilton and women's roles therein. Um, and you know, when you're reading it as a literature teacher, especially as a female literature teacher, um, you think uh, you think about um, her first big song is "Helpless," right? and so I, as I told my students, all the feminist spidey senses are tingling. You know, oh no, the you know the main female character or one of the two main female characters on her first song, um, you know, her first song is uh, "Helpless," and she's head over heels in love, and you know, her song is full of cliches I'm drowning in his beautiful eyes you know she mentions his mind you know once or twice in his eyes you know <laughs> so many more times um, and then um, by act two though you have her um, uh, definitely uh, taking on a more powerful role or displaying more agency at least um, when she's uh, talking about burn and so the idea is that she um, that she burnt the letters that might have you know exonerated uh, Hamilton so historians don't don't get to know what I said uh, after that Mariah Reynolds affair is uh, is revealed um, but then critics criticize that too um, one critic says is burning the letters and silence Silencing herself, the only uh, recourse she has left. Um, and so again, when you're thinking about feminism and literary criticism, you're always worried about, you know, oh my gosh, silencing women, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Um, 
So, uh, so there's that. Um, at least, um, you know. On the other hand, though, you know, in the play, she gets to say something. You know, whereas in real life, we have very little of what she said. And uh, in the play, um, to you know, argue the other side of it, she says, "You forfeit all rights to my heart, the place in our bed, and I hope you burn." <laughs> so she, so she does get to say something in the play. Um, and then let's see, moving, moving right along here. Uh, Eliza on politics, that's another way I chose to look at her fictional portrayal um, in the play. Um, I ask my students, is it bad that, you know, in, uh, in or anti-feminist in some way, in one sense that in track five, the Schuyler sisters, she's saying, look around at how lucky we are to be alive right now, and she's all excited about the revolution, whereas by the end of act one, it's, it's Hamilton saying, look around how lucky we are to be alive right now, as he's about to leave the family and go be the first um, secretary of the, uh, of the treasury. So one of the things I go over with my students is that um, if they're gonna write their essay on, you know, whether Ham, Ham, ah, Hamilton and uh, Alex and Eliza are feminist uh, plays or not is that um, you have to think of feminism in different schools and I like to tell them about American feminism and French feminism and so the American version of feminism um, to grossly oversimplify it um, has been uh, as the musical says, any, or not this musical, another musical, um, anything you can do, I can do better, right? And so where women try to do everything that men can do, we're gonna work, we're gonna have fewer children, we're not gonna talk about our kids, we're gonna get ahead in our career, we're gonna vote, we're gonna do everything that men do, we're gonna be like men, right? And so sometimes this American version of feminism has been criticized. And so in opposition to that, there's uh, French feminism and French literary criticism uh, from a feminist point of view. And uh, the French women took, the, uh, took a different approach in which they are going to celebrate all things female. We're not gonna turn ourselves into men. We're gonna celebrate everything that makes us women. We're gonna celebrate childbearing. We're gonna celebrate um, the domestic sphere. Um, we're going to celebrate um, women's experience in sexuality and, and, uh, and so on. Um, so one of the big questions then is when we see Eliza shift um, from being sort of a political enthusiast to, you know, by the end of Act One and throughout the play, kind of beg begging Hamilton to come home, you know, is that a feminist thing or not? And it depends how you define feminism. Uh, the French would probably say, yes, that's very feminist. She's standing up for the domestic sphere, the role of the family. She's constantly calling him home, pay attention to your family. Um, but uh, on the other hand, the, um, you know, the criticism that I've read, um, you know, from Americans, it's kind of like, oh, it's disappointed. She's not so much a revolutionary. She's just, you know, <laughs> you know she's just uh, having him, uh, you know, asking him to come home all the time. Wah, wah. You know? <laughs> um, so there's, uh, so there's that. Uh, let's see. All right. So I should have advance that slide sooner. Um, so family uh, versus career and you know how you see it. Um, also um, during Susan's presentation she mentioned forgiveness and um, you know forgiving Hamilton after you know having an affair and telling his story um, even after he died in this you know stupid duel right, and left her alone with <laughs> with nothing. Um, you know that um, I oh, just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, and so, you know, is her decision to forgive him for, you know, all of that, um, is that a thing that a strong person does? You know, often forgiveness is sort of maligned in popular culture as like, oh, that's just giving giving in, you're, you know, you're loyal to this person without, you know, thinking, how could you forgive that person? How could you go back to that person? This, you know, my students who are, you know, mostly 18, 19, 20 are often very merciless when they find out he cheated. <laughs> I have a very hard time um, accepting that. Um, but then, you know, I'll have other students, um, you know, particularly in the Christian tradition, who will speak of forgiveness as being a, an act of strength rather than an act of uh, weakness or somehow condoning the affair just because she forgives him. All right, so let's see. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. 
can't seem to make it go. Next slide. Okay. All right. Um, I think I'll go ahead here and move from the play to uh, to our piece of fiction, Alex and Eliza. Um, and so, uh, as uh, Susan showed, there is a young adult uh, novel of Hamilton, but um, I'm imagining it focuses mostly on Hamilton rather than um, Eliza. So. Yeah, it's not a romance. Yeah, so this is definitely, you know, your teenage girl romance, pink cover with a big heart on it. It's all prominently displayed at Target, so it's you know, something that people are buying. Um, also, Melissa De La Cruz is a young adult author who is already, you know, a bestseller and quite notable. And so she tells the story in the in the little uh, biographical blurb how her daughter. Uh, she and her daughter went to see Hamilton, and again, her daughter had questions. Right? <laughs> um, and so her daughter had remarked as well that the play ends with Eliza preserving his legacy. And so the daughter wants to know, you know more about Eliza. So, um, so Melissa De La Cruz, you know, writing this for, um, uh, for teenage women, right, is going to move Eliza from sort of the, sor the supporting role that she has in the play to the leading lady of this book. So even though it's called Alex and Eliza, it's, you know, very clearly um, more focused um, on Eliza. And so here we see Eliza, you know, not so helpless. And we see uh, Eliza and her sisters kind of teasing Hamilton the first time they met. Um, she steps on his foot with her big heel. You know, she's definitely um, right up there with um, Angelica and Peggy and, um, uh, you know, sort of making him work for it, right? <laughs> um, so she's definitely not helpless and then you know eventually there ends up a scene where he has to rescue her she and her traveling companions their carriage has broken down and so she's very clear about you know she will you know she will guide she will hold the reins as she rides the horse and he will sit behind her and he may only put his hands on her waist when she says so <laughs> and so there's very much uh, a lot of that um, on the other hand though you know, it's a book marketed at teenage girls. She falls asleep in his arms, and you know, <laughs> even it's not the first time in the book where he will rescue her for sure. So she has uh, perhaps more agency than she has in the play, um, but she has, um, you know, definitely her swooning moments, and you know, Hamilton comes in rescuing her um, as as well. Um, and again, uh, with my students, we talk about, you know, what are the um, sometimes conflicting gender expectations that we have today. Often a lot of us think about, oh, yay, women empowerment, but we still want to see Hamilton rescue her. We still want to see him carry her over the threshold, you know, as she's almost freezing to death to her aunt and uncle's house and, you know, making sure she's okay. Um, as the book progresses, there's uh, what we think is pretty much a fictitious um, other engagement that she has to get out of before she uh, marries Hamilton. And um, this is interesting, too, when we think about um, her power or agency. Um, her parents are telling her to marry this other, this other, um, this other man, Livingston, because um, he has more money, he's from an established family. Um, and so, you know, in some ways, we want to see Eliza resist that, and um, you know, at some points she does, um, but eventually she decides she's going to um, go along with this. Um, but it's not presented in a in a way that makes her totally helpless. Um, she she does decide to. Um, to concede to her parents' wishes, um, but it's framed as her making that decision um, to empower her family. Um, her aunt says, you know, if you run away, if you escape this marriage, you know, you're damaging the marriage and social prospects of all of your siblings, right? And your family's future, your family legacy. So even in agreeing to marry someone else, she's depicted as having um, a certain amount of um, agency or, uh, or power. Uh, but luckily, um, once it comes down to it, uh, Hamilton's able to save her from, <laughs> from that marriage um, as well. All right. Uh, let's see. Boop, boop. 
Do, 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 do. <laughs> okay, um, a couple of other curious uh, things as far as um, depicting Eliza and her involvement with the revolutionary cause. Um, we get just a little touch of that in, in the play, um, in the, um, the um, you know, her excitement in the Schuyler sisters. Um, but here it goes into a little more detail that she, you know, was um, working with the groups that were promoting, you know, the homespun fabrics. And um, so she's presented as, you know, refusing to wear a fancy dress to a ball in this novel when, you know, when uh, her sisters are all decked out and she's the plain one because she doesn't want to be a hypocrite. She's been telling people to save money and support the soldiers. Um, she's also depicted um, um, sewing uniforms for the soldiers, um, and uh, she takes quite a large role in the novel um, inoculating soldiers from smallpox. And while there's no evidence that she actually did this, um, Susan tells me that Abigail Adams did this. And so it would be a realistic thing um, for, uh, for her to do. Uh, let's see. And then, um, of course, there are um, some discussions in the novel of Eliza's uh, political views. Um, Eliza's friend tells Hamilton, you know, Eliza's bookish. She cares about fresh ideas, independence, democracy, abolition. <laughs> so once again, she's, uh, she's involved. Uh, let's see, see, see. Um, okay, I'm going to go past this a little bit. Um, let me skip to the bottom of this particular slide. Um, of course, since you know we don't have, as Susan said, a lot of records of what Eliza herself you know would have uh, would have said or uh, or written. Um, you know, De La Cruz in this novel has to fictionalize um, a lot of that. And so, um, you know, she has Eliza really speaking up at the end, um, right before Hamilton saves her and right as she's about to go marry this horrible person that she, <laughs> she's been set up with by the family. Um, she, asks, uh, she asks her friend if it hurts when you hide every last shred of your individuality and self-worth behind acres of silk uh, and cups of powder and smiles that never, no matter how hard you try, um, reach your eyes. <laughs> right. um, so she definitely speaks out that, you know, she um, believes in, you know, love marriage with intellectual uh, companionship and that she, uh, she doesn't want to just put on the brave face and have the smiles that never reach your eyes. Oops. Okay. And then just I put up some information in case you're uh, interested. The, your local Target has Alex and Eliza all over the shelves. Um, and then um, for um, the secondary sources, the ones that, um, that I mentioned, particularly with the views on, um, on feminism, is Hamilton a feminist play? And um, uh, things like that um, would be uh, the Michael uh, Shulman piece for The New Yorker that was um, a 2015 article. And then um, a, uh, the report um, or the blog, The Feminist uh, Spectator out of um, Princeton University had um, a good article on that as well. So those are some readings I'd recommend. Um, okay, so I hope we gave you a little picture of what Eliza was really like and uh, how she's been variously depicted in, uh, in fiction. So thanks again for coming. Again, this is Year of Demo Democratic Engagement and also uh, One Campus, One Book with our One Campus, One Book this year being Hamilton. Um, please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at OCOBMC. So One Campus, One Book, Moorpark College. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs>